Reshma Sujani has never asked for permission. She began her career as an attorney and activist. In 2010, she surged onto the political scene as the first Indian American to run for U.S. Congress. Now, she did not win the election, but she would be the first to tell you that if you haven't failed yet, you haven't tried anything. Even though she had no idea how to code, she had an idea and she went for it. In 2012, she founded Girls Who Code, a national nonprofit organization working to close the gender gap in technology and is leading the movement to inspire, educate, and equip young women with the computing skills to pursue 21st century opportunities. Thus far, the program has affected the lives of 40,000 girls in 50 states. We had the privilege of having Rashma speak at our win session at Inform. Rajma, thank you so much for agreeing to speak at our WIN session later on today and for taking some time out to do some one-on-one -on -one for me for the purposes of the WIN community. We're delighted to have you here and appreciate very much you giving us some of the, some time. So my first question to you is, wh where did the seed come from mm. to, to, to found and start Girls Who Code? Yeah, so I'm like a very strange person to start mm -hmm. Girls Who Code because I'm not a coder. I didn't major in computer science. I was terrified of math and science growing right. up. I uh, decided to run for office uh, in 2010 against uh, an incumbent. I lost, but as part of that journey, I would go into schools and I would see the gender divide in New York right. City classrooms. And I was like, what's going on? Like, mm -hmm. at a time where technology and automation is sort of, you know, changing everything about the way we live and work, we're leaving our girls behind. Mm -hmm. And so I started Girls Who Code in many ways as an experiment. Right. You know, spent about a year and a half researching everything about the issue. Right. And then just How launched a pilot program. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us some success stories. Yeah. What you've so achieved. Every year, 40,000 computer science graduates graduate from the country. Right. Fewer than one out of five are women. Right. We've taught 40,000 girls wow. over the past five years. We've quadrupled the talent pipeline That's in such incredible. a short period of time. And so what, where are you taking the program next? Yeah. What's next for Girls Who Code? Uh, world Continue domination. Continue the journey? Right. <laughs> uh, listen, I think that we want to you know, infiltrate the industry with, with female technical talent. We want to close the gender gap. Right. You know, I think that there are so many problems that we want to solve, but this is one that you actually can. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen the results. About 90% of our graduates are going on to major or minor in computer science. We're going to have 10,000 new female computer science graduates, mm -hmm. I mean, that are freshmen and uh, majoring in computer science in, in the fall. Like, right. this is happening. Like, we can do this. Right. In everything you've done and built and seen over the last number of years, mm -hmm. What are the things that um, you're, going, you're taking away that are going to impact the way in which you raise your boy? Yeah. So um, I already raised my son as like a feminist child. Right. He with me everywhere. When I spoke at the Women's March, he was like on my hip. <laughs> cool. um, you know, the thing that I think about a lot is one, you know, we have to change culture. Mm -hmm. Like I really do believe that you can't be what you cannot see. And when girls turn on the television or open up a magazine and they see what a computer scientist looks like, it's like a dude in a hoodie. Mm -hmm. And they don't see themselves in these images, and so we have to change that. You know, we're releasing a book series with Penguin this August uh, that basically tells the story of computer science wow. through the voice of a middle school girl. Wow. Five girls who look like me and you. Right. You know, who like m music and selfies and video right. games. And, and I think little girls will look at these images and say, oh, I look like her, like I can learn too. And the second thing I've been thinking and writing a lot about is this idea that I really do believe that we raise our girls to be perfect and we raise our boys to be brave. Um, you know, even with Sean, I was in his like music class the other day and I was watching, you know, the moms and the nannies with the little girls and they're fixing their dresses and straightening right. their bows and if they spill applesauce, they're like putting on the new outfit in a second. If you meet my son, he looks like Pigpen. You know, he's got a bigger mm. booger in his nose, right. his hair hasn't been combed, he's probably got his breakfast on his shirt. But it, that sense of freedom yes. to not be fixed and prodded and all those yeah. micro acts, they add up. They add up. And they add up for us feeling like we got to be perfect. You know, we have to get straight A's. We gravitate towards things that we're good at. We're nervous about critical feedback. Mm -hmm. We don't like failure and rejection. And it prevents us from leading. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to change that. And you are doing a great job of changing that. I hope so. There's more work to be done. But yeah, yeah. But yeah. And so what what should what should industry leaders, tech leaders, CEOs of tech companies, what what are the things or what are the advice that you would give to them yeah. in order to encourage more yeah. women to come in? So 
you know, company. we've had kind of a brutal couple weeks, right? With right. Uh, the yes. news and what we're reading about and hearing about what's happening with sexual harassment. You know, the industry is broken. Mm -hmm. And I salute all of the brave women who have come forward and really talked about their experiences. And, okay. and I've, I'm, I'm hopeful in seeing the swift change, change. right? Um, and I think that every single CEO, male and female, needs to do a stock of their corporate culture right. and to really understand what is happening, how are women being treated, are they actually having the opportunity to flourish? Mm -hmm. um, because you have to change culture. I think the second thing is, is that none of this is gonna change unless you have critical mass of women. We know this, mm -hmm. and we see this in other industries. You know, the finance industry felt 20 years ago very much like the tech industry looks today. Right. And a lot of that changed through, you know, speaking at Bank of America the other day, and you know, 45% of their workforce is female. Female, yeah. And so we need to have more women, and that's why I think investments in, in Girls Who Code, I mean, your, your CEO, Charles, made a big investment in Girls Who Code, you know, this year, we're, we're really, really grateful for that. Like, in, investing in building the pipeline to make sure that we can bring more women into the workforce is really important. And so what advice are you giving to these young girls that yeah. come through your organization? To be brave, to be, be imperfect. Brave to speak yeah. your mind, to invite rejection. I mean, if you want to be great, you have to live at the edge of your ability and critical feedback. Right. That's how I live my life. life. Like, tell me all the things that I did wrong. Right. You know I mean, and this idea of wanting to get better and not mm -hmm. taking it personal. What is the thing you're most proud of? Uh, all my, the things you've done. Of all the things. Fantastic things My girls, I mean, we're, every day I get an email or a text or a message from a girl who is like, Girls Who Crow changed my life. Mm -hmm. And it's not me, it's my entire team and people over the past six years who have just worked so hard mm -hmm. to serve these young girls. And um, like, you know, I've lost several campaigns. I was saying like mm -hmm. a serial failed politician. But in, in some ways it's like, I could never have made the difference as a junior congressman from New York City in the, compared to the difference that these young girls will make mm -hmm. in the world and in our country. Right. Let's come back to that for a second. You made a statement that if you haven't failed, you haven't even tried. Yeah. So, so tell us a bit more about you know you, you made reference yeah. to the you know running for, yeah. for for senator. Tell us a bit more about that and and what you've learned from it. So listen, I you know before I ran for Congress, I was literally made every decision based upon where am I going to have the best credential? Mm -hmm. So went you know pursued Harvard and Yale because it was Harvard and Yale. Mm -hmm. You know went to work at firms because of their names and mm -hmm. their reputations, not necessarily my desire to actually work at them. Right. And I spent all this time until my early 30s chasing credentials and pedigrees, and I woke up in the fetal position mm -hmm. and being just incredibly miserable because I was one of those little girls who knew exactly what she wanted to right. do. I wanted to make a difference. Right. And I was like you know doing mortgage derivatives instead of like changing the world right and that was soul crushing right and so I made like a hard pivot you know ran for Congress in a race that I was never going to win I didn't know it but you know taking a step back I was never gonna win but it was the best decision I ever right. made in my life right. because right. I now exercise like I'm brave in everything that I do yeah like I, I get rejected every day and I'm not gonna tell you it doesn't hurt but then I pick up and I keep moving and I wasn't doing that the first 30 years of my mm -hmm. life you know, I was going the safe route, yeah. and, and, and it, it led to an unjoyful life. It's, you know, to me, this is more than just about being brave so you can ask for promotion. Right. This is about being brave so you can live a happy life. life. Yeah, it's so true. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful that you talk openly about that topic because, because I think, you know, us women, we often feel that guarded sense yeah. of, of, of wanting to you know, stay away from things unless they're very successful. Yeah. So who's the, who's, who's the person that you look up to most? Is there a person that you look back on and think, wow, that well, person was very yeah. key to your value system? So Hillary your... Clinton was a huge role model for me in my life. Um, not just personally, but just watching her fail over and over again and just mm -hmm. like, you know, dust off dust that pantsuit yeah, and just like on. keep right. going. Right. And I, I've taken a lot from that spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, my girls are role models for me um, and watching, you know, I have girls who will like take two buses and two trains to go learn how to code, right. you know, and will just, are just audacious about what mm -hmm. their capacity and their capabilities are. And like, there's nothing more powerful being, than like the magic mm -hmm. of teenage girls and yeah. their expectations and their hopefulness. Yeah. Um, and I get to be surrounded by that all the time. I have a lot, I also am a big believer in horizontal mentorship. Right. I have a lot of women my age who are running organizations or companies, mm -hmm. have young kids, are trying to figure it all out, right. 
you know, and messing up in the process, but we speak to one another and we share information with one another right. or we text them like, hey, do you have two minutes? I want to run this by right. you. And like, what should I do? And, and, and I look up to them. Yeah. You're a fantastic inspiration. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us Thank today. you so much. Thank you.